it's really, really fun to be together and to see how God is going to walk with us in this new place. Everyone's new here. Um, I'm new as of two weeks, and um, we're still figuring out how our routines work in, in here, and, um, but so far it's been a, been a really great blessing. I got to sit down with Julie this week and, and dream about where God might take us. So um, God is doing new things, and I hope he's doing new things in your life, too, that are really, really good and beautiful. Um, and to that end, we're starting a new series on the book of Nehemiah. Um, the book of Nehemiah is a book about God building things, rebuilding things, actually, which is um, the story of our lives. It's the story of what God is doing in the world. The world is, is broken um, because of sin, and it shows up in our lives in all sorts of ways, and yet God is there loving us and mending things together and putting them back together the way they were supposed to be. Um, and uh, so we're going to look at what it, what it looks like um, to be a part of what God is doing and to build things. And um, that's kind of where this, this idea um, that the sermon is, is um, what's it take to be a difference maker? And we don't make that difference all on our own. What's it, what's it mean to join God and to be a difference maker? Last night, um, I got invited by the Colts to go to a fundraiser. Actually, uh, Chase invited me, and I, and I said, oh, that sounds cool, but I never quite committed. And then Scott invited me, and then Scott invited me again, and finally I said, yeah, we got to go. <laughs> um, but it was this really cool fundraiser on, um, for uh, Young Life uh, Capernaum, which is um, a special section of Young Life which reaches out to young adults and um, gives them a place to have fun and to connect with each other and to connect with the Lord. Um, a special place for families and young adults who have disabilities. And um, it was the coolest environment to see a bunch of people who come together to love God, love kids, love each other, and that's pretty much it, um, and, and how God has worked through that. And then the guy got up to speak, and he goes, you know what, I'm going to talk about Nehemiah. <laughs> Really? Is everybody doing Nehemiah right now? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's the cool book. Um, and then he kept saying, uh, as you all know in the story, and I'm like, who's reading Nehemiah besides me? I thought I was the only one, so I'll try not to do that. Um, but we're going we're gonna to take a walk through it. Um, as we do so, I want to um, ask a quick question. Think about, in a given day, about how many people you interact with. From the smallest interaction of saying hi to the person as you get on the bus to the end of the day when you say goodnight to whoever's in your house, even if that's a cat. Um, how many people, how many interactions do you have in a day? I'm betting it's a lot. I'm betting if we really totaled every single one and kept a clicker or something, we would be 100 or so. Um, each one of those is an opportunity to bless somebody or to not bless them, and to send it the other way. Um, and as I look around this room, as I know many of you, um, I feel so lucky to have gotten to serve here for a couple of years. Um, I see tremendous people with tremendous gifts, um, and I've experienced the way that you can love people. And um, that excites me, because honestly, I see a ton of ripples that can go out from our lives into some really, really, beautiful things. Um, so we're going to focus for the next 20 minutes or so on, on what it would take to be somebody who God could do beautiful things through. Um, I want to give an example of these ripples that go out from our lives. Um, Christina and I are in the middle of, of trying to get into a new house, and part of that is um, there's finance people who need to look at like every aspect of our life and get every document that has meant anything over the last I don't know how long and then double check every document and so I was I was on a phone call with this lady and and she says oh I see that you're a pastor and I'm like oh boy <laughs> wonder how this is gonna go but then she just kind of stopped her financial checkboxing which finance people are very structured and they do checkboxes really well um, and she goes Thanks for being a pastor. I appreciate how you invest in people. And it kind of sat there, and it felt weird for a minute. But then it was like, she took five seconds out of her entire work day, and I walked around for the rest of the day going, oh, maybe what I do does matter. That's cool. I like that. Um, another interaction that I had last week uh, when I went to go pick up the U-Haul, uh, 
I rolled into the place. I was super early. Uh, nobody was really there at like whatever, 7.30. And, uh, and the guy was sitting at the counter and I clearly had invaded his space. You know, he's like, oh. As I walk in the door and then I walk up to the counter and, and I'm putting on like my compensate for his unhappiness face where I'm like, hey, good morning. You get to move the church today. It's going to be awesome. And uh, he's like, what's your last name? So I told him and he pulls up the, the piece of paper and he's like, sign this. So he hands me the document that I got to sign and I sign it, I hand it back to him. And then he looks at me with this disdain and he's like, you didn't initial the highlighted boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I initialed it and I got the keys, but I ended up walking away being like, bummer. Like, that guy's day is horrible. Who knows if I made it worse by being too happy and then I'm worried about, I don't know. But it was a ripple, just a little ripple that came out from his life and, and I got to experience it and it wasn't as awesome as the other one. Um, I have this image of, of boats. We get to see them out on Lake Washington or whatnot. And, and they always have a wake behind them. And it's just that triangle that comes out from the boat. And um, we are people who leave wakes and ripples. We can't help it. We're going to affect people. And the more and more I um, sit with that idea, the more and more I realize it isn't necessarily even anything intentional. It's really who we are comes out on the people around us. Um, so what does it look like for God to form our character and to form our hearts in such a way that we can be people who the ripples are really beautiful? Um, Nehemiah was a guy who the ripples came out from his life in really, really beautiful, cool <clears throat> ways. Um, and it came out in the middle of difficulties. And if you think about where people become difference makers, it's often in the middle of really tough stuff that they've gone through. You know, somebody survives cancer, and they have a whole nother way of caring about cancer um, people, sufferers. Like, what we struggle with becomes a very passionate, beautiful thing when God can get a hold of it. And so, um, we're going to look at Nehemiah and what he, uh, what what troubles he encountered, and how God was able to use it. To do that, I got to give you a little bit of history, though. Um, Biblical history is not the most exciting subject, but I have to give you a little bit to get into Nehemiah. So, um, Israel was cruising along as a nation, and um, in 586 BC, the Babylonian Empire came and sacked Jerusalem, uh, overtook Jerusalem, and it fell. And um, the Babylonian was a tough people to be conquered by because their plan to control any sort of province that they that they took over was to scatter everybody so they would take a little bit of people from here a little people from here a little people from here and they would assign them to go live over in this section and there wouldn't be enough of them to really create a, a pure rebellion and then they would um, rule them with an iron fist they would have military troops and they would just dominate so that nobody could rebel against them um, it was a hopeless way of being well then, in 539 BC, um, the Persian Empire began to take over the Babylonian Empire. And they had a totally different strategy about how they would govern these people scattered all over who had been conquered. And the way they did it was um, they invited them to contribute to the Persian culture. They figured the more blessings we get from all over the world, the better we're off we're going to be. So what do you bring to this that could contribute? And um, Part of their faith was honoring other people's religions, and so they they um, did what they could to encourage people to go, hey, you know what, your faith is important, so let's let's see what we can do to validate that. And um, one of the things they did with the Israelites was they said, here we don't want rebellions, we want to to work together on something. So how about however many of you want to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild? We will give you the stuff that was taken out of the temple. And however many of you want to go back and rebuild, you're free to do so. And so a small group of people decided that they would like to do this. They would like to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild um, the temple. And um, into that, uh, Nehemiah appears. He is a guy with a great position. Um, he's the cupbearer to the king. 
of Persia, Artaxerxes. He did that for 40 years. And um, we're going to encounter some of the story. So let me read um, part of it for you. It's a little bit of a longer passage, but I hope you can hang on through it. It's um, Nehemiah 1 through uh, Nehemiah 2.9. In the words of Nehemiah, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, boy, we're going to do biblical names. All right, here we go. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some of the other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant, remnant that survived the exile and how they were doing in Jerusalem. And they said to me, "Those who survived the exile are back in the province, but they're in great trouble. They're in disgrace." The walls of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. Now, for a city to be broken down and the gates to be burned with fire, that meant it is not safe. Um, it was open to being invaded, and um, it was not thriving. And people are trying to rebuild while also fearing for their lives. So when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. And for some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive, let your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands or decrees or laws that you gave your servant. Remember the instructions that you gave your servant Moses when you said, If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you. But if you return to me and obey my commands, even if you're exiled to the farthest horizon, I'll gather you from that place and bring you to the place of my dwelling. And there are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayers of the servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cupbearer to the king. They're making snacks. It's an important part of the church. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took that wine and I gave it to the king, and I had never been sad before in his presence. And so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad, but you're not sick? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what is it that you want? And then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to that city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. And then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, well, how long will that take? And it pleased the king to send me, so I told him a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, can I also have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that I can get safe conduct until I arrive? And may I also have a letter to the keeper of the king's forest so that I can take timber to make beams for the gates in the citadel and the temple and the city wall? And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. And so I went and gave the king's letters. And the king sent his officers and cavalry with me. That's Nehemiah's story. Um, and there's three things I want to draw out of this that I think we can apply to our lives and how we can be difference makers like him. We can begin this journey of, of interacting with a world that's broken and, and our lives that are frankly broken at times and see how God can mend them together. And the first um, thing is um, he had a gift of compassion. Um, it starts in those first couple of verses, you know, he, he asks how things are going with those other people. I mean, they're his people, they're, they're the nation of, of Israel. How are they doing back in Jerusalem? And his brother reports to him, it's a mess. They're struggling, it, it, they're in danger, and it's not going well. Um, and at that moment, he has two options. One is uh, probably the one I find myself taking too often, and that's to go, oh, what a bummer. 
but really, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I'm a cupbearer in the king's court, so I guess, I guess I, I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm comfortable, I, and I'm reminded that I'm blessed for where I am. Uh, and I feel bad about where they are, but that's where it ends. But he takes it a step further. Um, compassion is when we suffer with somebody. That's actually what the word means. Um, it's a Latin word that means to suffer with somebody. Um, and it says that he wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed. The news of how this other group was doing affected him. Um, and it doesn't take long, but it's just this little moment of going, man, I wonder what it's like for them right now. And a connection to them to go, I'm not that different from them. Do you realize that that other person that we look at, when we look at other groups, is really not that different from ourselves? If we grew up in a different house, if we had a couple different twists and turns in our lives, we would be in the exact same place. And so, we're not all that different. And Nehemiah was a guy who understood that and said, man, we're all in this together. And so he had compassion. Um, the Dalai Lama, cool guy, really, really liked the Dalai Lama. I mean, who doesn't? Um, but he said something really striking about compassion. He said, you know, love and compassion, they're not luxuries. They're not like, oh, let's add that to our lives. They are necessities because without that, humanity can't survive. Our world cannot become a better place unless people love each other and have compassion for one another. Um, while I was looking up and figuring out what compassion means, I also looked up the opposite of it, indifference. I don't really care. I'm too busy with my life to really care about what's going on over there. Um, that's the opposite, and it, and it pops up in little ways. I know this week I was having a conversation with John, the other pastor, and we were talking about a colleague in ministry and some things going on in his church. and. Um, we both care about that church a lot, and so I was disagreeing with something that this guy did, and, and I had brought it up to John for his opinion, and I go, well, John, here's what's going on, and uh, I said, I, I just don't think he's making the right move. And um, John turned to me, and he goes, I don't really know everything that's going on, but I'm betting if I was in his shoes, I might do the same thing. And it was such a wise answer because it made me stop for a second and go, oh yeah, I don't know it all. And what's it like to be him? That's compassion. Um, and it's a really beautiful thing because it's, it's this process we go through where we say, I'm not just going to care about my own life, but I'm actually going to care about somebody else's life enough to stop thinking about myself for a little bit and imagine life for them. Jesus laid down his life for us. He set aside heaven, his life, because he loved us enough to imagine what it's like to be in our shoes and to live here for a while. And then he laid down his life for us. And when we follow Jesus' pattern, beautiful things happen, and God's divine things happen. And so this act of having compassion on somebody is actually repeating that process, and it's no wonder God uses it to create beautiful things. Um, I like a band called the Pesh Mode. It's not for everybody. I don't know if you like the Pesh Mode. A lot of people don't. It's okay. I don't take it offensively. Uh, but there's this song that they wrote called Walking in My Shoes, and it's sort of an answer to their critics about their lifestyle. And they had a rock star lifestyle, and um, and, I, and the words are really striking to me because I think um, it matches some things that I've heard. And the, the lyrics of the, the chorus go like this. Um, now, I'm not looking for absolution. I'm not looking for forgiveness for the things that I do. But before you come to any conclusions about me, try walking in my shoes. You would stumble in my footsteps. You would keep the same appointments I've kept if you tried walking in my shoes. It's kind of an up-in-your-face thing to do that, but it does bring about the same result. What's it look like for us when we meet people to do that? Um, what if God had come to us, instead of in Jesus, uh, 
who, who loved and invited all sorts of people around him um, and then showed them that God had something beautiful for them. What if God instead had come and said, I have a list of all the things that you need to quit doing and start doing in order for me to love you? There would be no redemption. So the question is, what does it look like for us to approach people the same way? To go, I want to love and understand you. I want to care about you. And that's where we'll start. And then we'll see what God can do in us together. Um, perfect example for me. I show up at church. I'm usually frantic most Sunday mornings. And Jonathan, uh, moneymaker, will, will come up to me and go, Hey, Chris, how you doing? And I will usually, like, looking around at where the toaster might be that I need to get set up, will go, I'm fine. And then Jonathan will look me in the eye and go, Chris, how are you doing? <laughs> and I usually won't give him an honest answer because I'm still frantic. And I don't take the time to give him a real answer. Um, but it still has the same effect. For a moment, I know that Jonathan has set aside his own life and cares how I'm doing. And that one little ripple that we can send out into the world can make dramatic differences when God uses us. Those hundred times that you interact with somebody, a little bit of that goes a very long way. The second thing um, that Nehemiah does, his reaction to um, what he hears, this trouble that they're going through, is he prays. Um, Prayer is a really cool thing. He brings it to God. And I, I want to work through his prayer really briefly. Um, and the first thing that he does is he recognizes who God is. Um, and listen to this. He says, O oh Lord, God of heaven, you are great and awesome. You keep your covenant of love with those who love you. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant. God, you are awesome and powerful and you love. That foundation is what we bring when we bring things to God. We're bringing it to the attention who can actually, someone who can actually make a difference in the world and who loves people. That's the God that we are going to. You are great and awesome and you are loving. And then the next thing he does is he doesn't separate himself and pray for those people. He says, I'm with you. We haven't done what's right. We've been wicked our families, my father, me, um, we don't deserve your blessing, God, but, but we need it. So will you bless those people in Jerusalem? And then he ends his prayer. It's really weird. It, it, it doesn't fit, actually. He says, um, so God, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And he's talking about the king. He's talking about Jerusalem. Like, I'm praying for Jerusalem, and then all of a sudden he's like, God, give me favor as I approach this man today. Um, where I came to faith was in my uh, old pastor's house. It was, it was weekend after weekend I would hang out in my pastor's house. And, and at the time I started going to the church, I just liked his daughter a lot. And at the end of going to that church, I had come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and I remember one of the things I would do is after a meal, I would go in the kitchen and I would wash dishes with, um, with this girl that I like's mom. And we would have great talks. And I remember once asking her, like, okay, so this prayer thing, I don't, I don't really get it. What do you pray about? She was like, well, probably the thing I pray about the most is my family. And then she clarified something that was very important to me. She said, um, I don't just pray for my kids that certain things would happen in their life. I pray about what sort of mom I can be. So I pray for God to make me a, a wise mom, or a patient mom, or a, a mom who's able to guide them well. And, and so a lot of my praying is actually about what sort of person I might be. And Nehemiah doesn't just pray for things out there. Um, he prays for God to make him into the type of person who can make a difference. I love prayer. Prayer is a cool thing because no one can stop you from praying for somebody. And when you see something on the news, I watch the news and most of it feels very depressing and very far away and things I can do nothing about. 
Um, and yet, God leaves this open door to go, what do you want to see happen, Chris? What do you, what do you want to pray for? And I can watch something that is terrible, and I don't know the mysteries of prayer or how it works, but I honestly believe that when I see something that is terrible in the world and unjust, and I feel incredibly powerless to do anything about it, I can say, God, what can you do? Please, move in that situation. And all of a sudden, things can happen. Um, and I pray for the type of person who God might make me. The last thing that he does is um, he invites people along. He doesn't do it alone. Um, it was such a gift from the cults to invite Christina and I to go to this fundraising dinner for this ministry because we got invited into something that was bigger than ourselves. And Nehemiah could have gone and done stuff himself. He could have called his boss and said, you know what? It's been great being a cupbearer, but I got to quit. I got other stuff that God's put on my heart. But he doesn't. He he shows up for work, um, cupbearer to the king, and he says, I've never been in your presence sad before. Now, I hardly believe that that meant that he was always happy up until that day. Um, but his job is to be the waiter. Like, waiters are supposed to smile, and they show up at your table and go, here's... He shows up, and he's, he's downcast. He's sad. He's letting his emotions be known. Um, and the king picks up on it. And um, he tells the king what's going on. And he asks him if he wants to be a part of it. Um, and then he's really gutsy when he asks him to fund the whole project. <laughs> did, you, did you catch that? <laughs> By the way, king, do you mind? Uh, I need a letter that says that you're going to pay for all the supplies. Um, but the king cares about Nehemiah. And goes, yeah, I want to do that others into beautiful things where God can work. Um, I was thinking about uh, Linda's birthday. Linda had her 70th birthday this, this year, not too long ago. And um, she's sitting back there with Molly. And about two and a half, three years ago, whenever it was I got to the church, one of the first things that a new pastor wants to do at a church is kick off some new program <laughs> that everyone can get involved with so they know that uh, they're doing something. And so... Uh, so I had this program called Have To Give One. And the idea was if you got two jackets, you probably can't wear them both at the same time. So why don't you give one of them away to some folks who can need it? And so we started giving jackets to Union Gospel Mission. I expected that to go on for a couple of weeks. Um, but Molly's been doing this for three years now. Like she will not let this go. It just keeps going and going. And uh, I've gotten to do a couple carloads with her and to bring stuff down there. And this, this ministry keeps going well. Molly's in a small group with Linda, and, and, and Linda had her birthday and said, you know what, I don't need more stuff. How about everybody's presents be things that they can donate to Union Gospel Mission, and then Molly will bring them all down there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she asked Molly first. Either, but, <laughs> but this thing of inviting people into things started creating joy and ministry and restoration for more than just Molly or Union Gospel Mission. But now it was on Linda, and Linda's friends got to be a part of it. And this ripple goes out, and we all get collected into this beautiful work that God is doing. So three really pretty simple things. Compassion, taking time enough to care about somebody besides ourselves. Praying so that God can shape our hearts and maybe even do something in the midst of it and then seeing what we can do about it. That's a very easy process that God can use to change things. So the challenge this week for us is can we approach people that way? Can we, can we approach people and go, I wonder what it's like for them, pray for them, see what we can do about it, and maybe even invite somebody else into it. Um, I want to close with a quote. Uh, Frederick Buechner, um, talked about vocation, and I don't think he was talking just about jobs. He was saying, what is it that you're going to do in the world? What's your purpose on, on earth? What is it we are about? And he defined it as uh, where our passion meets the world's need. Um, and I believe that our, our life without purpose is, is just wading through the mud. We are here for a reason. We're here 
be a part of something. And um, where your passion, where your heart stops for somebody else, meeting somebody else's need creates a whole huge dynamo of life for us and for the people that we interact with. So let's be those kinds of people. Let's be people who make a difference, who set aside our lives just long enough to care and to pray and to do something about it. Sound good? Mm-hmm. All right. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are in the process of rebuilding. Thank you that you stopped uh, what you were doing long enough to care about us um, and to welcome us in and to tell us that you love us. And God, um, thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. We want to respond by doing work in the lives of the people that you love. So help us to slow down a little bit this week, to care a little bit, um, to pray for people a little bit, and to see what we can do for somebody. We love you.